Welcome everybody to uh, join us tonight for the uh, rollout uh, event for our new report at Center for New American Security, Building Better Generals. And on behalf of uh, our CEO, Bob Wark, and our President, Richard Fontaine, we're, we're delighted to have uh, so many of the friends of uh, CNAS here in the room tonight. Uh, and I think uh, a group who know each other in many cases, I looked at the list here today, and I think are in for an entertaining evening. We're very much looking forward to interacting with all of you. Uh, what we'll hear tonight is a discussion first and then uh, your questions and answers about a report uh, that we've been working on for about the last year or so. Uh, and it was underwritten by a generous grant from the Smith Richardson Foundation, which allowed us to put a lot of time and energy and effort into uh, producing what we think is a, a meaningful and important contribution to thinking about building the best generals and admirals for my Navy friends in here, uh, who, who cited that clearly admirals are doing fine and we would have included them in the report. But uh, we, we, uh, we are excited about some of the uh, findings that we have, some of the recommendations we're making, and we look forward to uh, discussing that with you here tonight. I'll be introducing our panel here in just a moment. Uh, but first I want to highlight uh, our report's four co-authors. Um, two of whom are on stage, Dr. Nora Benzhell and myself, and two of whom are here in the first row of the audience, uh, Kelly Saylor and Kate Kidder, stellar research associates who actually had pen to paper to create significant portions of this report, and whose mm -hmm. names, because of that, are on the cover. So we're, we're delighted they're here. Uh, even though they're not on stage here tonight, they made a huge contribution uh, to this overall product. Uh, this time, let me introduce our panel. And I uh, would, would highlight to you that the full biographies are in your program, and I'm just going to touch on a few of the highlights uh, and hope they won't be too insulted by me not going into their, their full bios here this evening. Uh, on my immediate left is uh, report co-author Dr. Nora Bensahel, who's both a senior fellow and the deputy director of studies at CNAS. She's the author of numerous works at Center for New American Security and previously served as a senior political scientist at RAND Corporation publishing a large number of reports there to include the landmark study on up, the uh, update of don't ask, don't tell policy that had a very significant effect on the ultimate change of that policy here in the US military. Uh, to her immediate left is Dr. Tim Kane, who is the chief economist at the Hudson Institute and also the author of several books, for this audience probably the best known of which is Bleeding Talent. Uh, which is a very incisive report looking at how the military manages its leadership, its skills, its uh, non-commissioned officer and officer leaders principally, and what could be done differently to emulate some of the best practices in industry. And he'll be able to connect into that, I think, well during the course of the discussion here tonight. Tim is also the founder of the social networking firm StoryPoint and has done uh, extensive work on entrepreneurship and job creation. And then finally, to my right is Dr. Paula Thornhill, a Brigadier General, U.S. Air Force, retired, who is currently a senior political scientist at RAND and the director of the strategy and doctrine program at RAND's Project Air Force. Uh, Paula's last duty assignment in the Air Force was direct, director of the Air Force Institute of Technology, and she previously served as the dean of faculty and academic programs at the National War College. She has a great deal of experience in professional military education has written uh, on that topic as well, to include an important piece on the capstone program for flag and general officers. So very distinguished panel, lots of experience, uh, several report co-authors, and, and several folks who uh, I think will have uh, some diverse opinions about the report, a good way to kick off our evening here tonight before we turn it over to your Q&A. So before we start the panel discussion, uh, Nora and I would like to take a few minutes just to touch on several of the key highlights of the report itself. And again, you've got copies out there, they're, they're online now, but we'll, uh, we'll touch on, I think, most th throughout the course of the evening here, most of the, the key insights, so when you walk away tonight, you'll have a very good feel for that. Why we wrote the report, first of all. And this gets back into uh, some of the questions we got during our various research uh, study trips. Uh, partly along the lines is, is there really a problem? What are we trying to fix? Uh, don't we have the best system of producing flag and general officers in the world here in the United States military? And that's a tough question to ask. And, and we, we touched lightly on the report at a retrospective look at the last dozen years of military performance. And there are plenty of authors out there 
uh, who have been either very critical or somewhat critical at, ranging from Tom Ricks in his book, The Generals, uh, to Paul Yingling and his piece on a failure of generalship here a few years ago in Armed Forces Journal. So our, our purpose in writing this report was really not to go back and do a deep dive analysis into the performance of general officers and flag officers, but really to look ahead. We recognize that we're in a period of significant change coming out of 12 years of two wars in a in counterinsurgency environment that has really twisted or distorted the military in some ways that are perhaps not going to prepare our senior leaders for the next dozen or so years to the front. We've seen shortened professional military education and eliminated PME in some cases. We've seen assignments that have been abbreviated and a lack of opportunities to have broadening assignments. Uh, we've seen uh, shorter tours, both overseas and here in the United States, for, for many officers. And looking ahead, we're seeing a world that's going to be much different than a world of regular warfare. We're seeing one where we've got fast-moving changes, instability around the world, uh, a different shifting of emphasis on what kinds of conflicts we're going to fight, and we're clearly seeing deeply reduced budgets. They're going to have an immense impact across the military establishment, to include possibly on the education of our officer corps. We'll, we'll see fewer generals. Uh, and we'll probably see as well, we, we believe, and we're already seeing this, longer career paths with more time to serve, perhaps out to as much as 40 years and beyond, which is becoming far more common now with some changes mm -hmm. in the system in the last <clears throat> few years than was ever the case a decade or more ago. So the question we posed for ourselves essentially was not what's wrong, but how do we best prepare the next generation, those that are rising today, to reach the top and be the most capable flag and general officers that the United States can produce, to be able to meet not the needs of yesterday, uh, the last decade and more, but the needs of tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. And we're, we're particularly struck that, and we're going to talk about this during the course of our discussion, that next generation and the next generation after that are already in uniform today. Uh, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the year 2050 uh, just graduated from ROTC or West Point or the Air Force Academy this year. Now, the Chief of Naval Operations in 2040 is a woman who's a XO on a nuclear sub somewhere around the world today and a lieutenant commander. Those folks are already in the system. So our, our goal is to find a way to make that system the best possible one it can be for them as we go ahead. I won't talk too much on our methodology. We had a number of visits. We had working groups. We had, uh, obviously, a deep literature research. We had a number of interviews with senior officers, active and retired. And, uh, and had some opportunity to look at best corporate practices, which we're going to touch on as well. So a pretty good opportunity over the year to look at this subject in some significant depth. Let me, let me turn now to uh, Nora to talk a bit about some of the highlights of what we found after this year of research. Thanks very much, Dave. The recommendations and analysis in the report are largely grouped into three different categories, and I'm going to talk briefly about, about each of them. Um, the first is, uh, is assignments and where generals are assigned to serve. The second is education. And the third is the selection and evaluations process. So I'll start with the assignments process. As is well understood, particularly in an audience uh, like this one, there is a really strong tendency within the military <coughs> to promote skilled operators and tacticians to flag rank. Now, this makes some amount of sense, right? You don't want to promote somebody who can't command at whatever level it is uh, to the next higher rank. But this tendency of promoting operators is particularly pronounced at the flag rank. Um, and there's a landmark study that uh, is, has come out of West Point that shows that approximately 80% of three stars, this is not actually just in the Army, this is service-wide, 80% of three stars and 85% of four stars have been promoted from the operational career fields. One of the things we discovered in the course of our research, though, is that there is a substantial misalignment between the skills of operators and the skills that you need at flag rank to manage the defense enterprise. Everything from logistical planning to acquisition to talent management throughout the force. Each service has a different distribution of operational versus enterprise billets, as we talk about them uh, in our report. But Approximately in the Army now, 82% of three-star billets and 92% of four-star billets are non-operational enterprise management positions. So you're promoting a very high percentage of operators for what are very few operational billets at the general and, and flag officer rank um, when the vast majority of those positions are really defense management positions. So at the four-star rank, you have a pool of less than 15% of officers with enterprise experience and 92% of billets for those officers are enterprise. So that's clearly a problem that we wanted to address in the report. 
the way that we recommend addressing that is by dividing the flag officer population into two different tracks, which we call the operational track and the enterprise track. We argued that this would enable officers to develop more specialized expertise in educational and development opportunities to prepare them for the assignments that they will be in and also to allow them to hold repeat assignments in their given track so that there can be learning over time in the particular areas that they specialize in. In conjunction with this, we also recommend longer assignment tenures. Today's Army four-star generals, for example, are spending as little as 15 months in an assignment which is scarcely enough time to master the job, let alone to truly learn from experience, to make decisions, to see what their consequences are, and then learn how to do better the next time. We recommend lengthening tenures to a minimum of three years, which we believe would both deepen officer expertise and encourage innovation and prudent risk taking. One of the counter arguments we've heard to this is that um, short assignments have, have been commonly the norm because there simply isn't enough time, some people argue, in a general officer's career for any extension. But this is where the finding that many officer careers are now lasting much longer than they used to, to 40 years and beyond, becomes really important. Um, because that enables much more time for deeper assignments, for broadening experiences, without having to trade off any of the current things that general and flag officers must do. You can add time into that period when they're serving as, uh, as flag officers um, in order to, to be able to compensate and develop that level of in-depth expertise. The second area that, I, uh, that we talk about in the report is education. And given that officer careers are lengthening in the way that both of us just described, and the fact that right now most officers usually receive their last substantial educational opportunity at the war college level, which usually, depending on the particular service an officer, occurs between years 18 and 22 years of service. What this means is that most officers who serve at flag rank will not have any extended educational opportunities in the entire second half of their careers. This is something that all of the services emphasize to you know, tremendously in the first half, up, in the, up to that 20 or 22 year mark. And then there is virtually nothing other than some ad hoc executive courses here or there. Why is this so important? Why do we put such emphasis on, on education? There's a quote that I really like by Daphne du Maurier that says, no crisis can break through the, the crust of habit. But education really does help you break through that, right? It gives you new ideas. It gives you a chance to think about things in new and creative ways while uh, you're taking a step back from your immediate day-to-day -day assignments that then you can take back to your, uh, to your next assignments and, and further it. We recommend in the report taking advantage of the time provided by these extended careers that we talk about to provide officers with robust and tailored education to support their assigned track, whether that's operational or enterprise. For the officers on the uh, operational track, we recommend uh, creating a new course that will be loosely modeled on the uh, British Higher Command and Staff course, uh, which is about a three-month course that um, emphasizes strategic and political military skills. And we talk in more detail in the report about the topics that, that we recommend covering there. We propose that officers on the exec enterprise track attend business schools and corporate and executive leadership programs supplemented by military-specific courses. They do a fair amount of it today, but again, as I said, it's very ad hoc, and this would be in a much more structured way to build particular skills. And most importantly, all the courses, both those in the operational track and those in the enterprise one, should have graded writing and speaking requirements, and students must be held accountable for their performance, which is not necessarily something that happens today. That process of reading, writing, um, and engaging in debate with fellow students is what really enables the learning process, and it's, it's very often absent. Uh, in, some of the current, um, in some of the current PME courses today, and certainly in the shorter courses that officers who are selected for flag rank receive. The third and final area that we talk about in the report is the selection and evaluation process. And we recommend a, a selection and evaluation process that improves accountability for senior military leaders. One of the things that we found in the report that really became crystallized to us in the course of our research is that Currently, officers in ranks up through two-star are held accountable through promotion boards and through written fitness uh, evaluations that are written evaluations that are part of an annual fitness report. But once an officer reaches three-star rank, that process disappears entirely. That officer will never again receive go before another promotion before 
board will never get another written set of evaluations and will rarely engage in a conversation uh, with his or her superior about what the expectations for a job is and uh, what the goals of that position are. This is a very substantial weakness of the current system and one that's no doubt contributed to some of the ongoing high profile cases of accountability and the credibility of the military senior leadership. To correct this, we require requiring all officers, including at the three and four star rank, uh, to have performance reviews and written evaluations, as well as mandating those sessions with superiors so that those expectations and goals can be set, and that will additionally promote mentorship and continuous self-development. So those are the key highlights of the report. There's a lot there for us to dive into, and I'll turn it back over to Dave to moderate our panel discussion. Well, great, thanks. We're going to uh, turn now to uh, the panel discussion itself. We're going to make that last probably about 25 minutes to make sure we reserve at least uh, 30 to 35 minutes for your questions, which I think will be even more interesting than the ones we have for ourselves up here. But this will be a conversation between the group. We've got uh, different backgrounds and different viewpoints on a number of these things. So uh, we look forward to kicking off the evening and getting into some of the topics that are probably on your mind already. Let me start with uh, one of the big takeaways of the report, and we've alluded to this briefly already, and that's the lengthening of career paths, especially at the three and four star level, to as much as 40 years and beyond. Uh, when Admiral Mike Mullen retired here uh, about two years ago, he had 42 years of service. When General Dempsey retires at the end of four years as the chairman, he'll have 41 years of service. We're seeing it become much more common now for officers, particularly at the four star rank, but even senior three stars going out to 37, 38, 39 years of service. This also takes advantage of you know, longer time periods of health, uh, more robust individuals, uh, uh, and a lot more time, and change the military retirement system that has taken away incentives to retire early. Now we have a retirement system that extends instead of to 30 years and 75% is the maximum take home retirement. Now it's 40 years at 100% of base pay and it continues to extend beyond that. So many of those incentives that cause people to leave and even to be promoted in some cases earlier have now gone away, which all contributes to a, a longer career path. So that, that creates some interesting opportunities for longer assignments, for more depth, more experience, uh, more time to, to have people serve at the peak of their skills, uh, not necessarily leading tr troops up mountainsides in, in frontal attacks, but doing the hard intellectual work that's required for most three and four star billets out there. Tim, you've written quite a bit on the uh, idea of matching skills with people. What, what impression did you draw from this idea, both of longer careers and the idea of tracking people into different sets? So, uh, Dave, I don't know if you know this. My dad served in the Air Force, and he retired as an E-9. And he told me, talking about long service, about this crusty old master sergeant at Kunsan Air Base who's been there at least 40 years. So it's not just the officer corps. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's a great idea. And let me say at the outset, um, I I've read every word in this report. I loved it. Um, I come from a little bit different perspective in my policy analysis. Um, I served a very short time in the Air Force, uh, but have stayed close to friends who are doing everything from flying Air Force Two to managing multi-million dollar research projects. Um, I think we need a more flexible force. And it's not just what I think. Uh, a survey that I did, and thank you for alluding to bleeding talent, a survey I did of 250 West Point grads, including senior uh, Army officers, has been mirrored in other surveys done by the Army of Army personnel, uh, including ROTC, OCS, um, commissioning sources. So this, when I say I think, based on the opinions of the, of the military, um, Everybody's frustrated with the personnel system. Commanders are frustrated that they don't have the flexibility they want. And when we talk about building a, a better, <clears throat> building better generals, um, I think we'd all agree we have great generals in the military and great admirals. But oftentimes they survive uh, despite the system. The bureaucracy's actually gotten in the way. And I loved the references in this report to some of the tenure of people like Curtis LeMay who served for nine years as commander of Strategic Air Command, um, and Rickover, who served, I lost how, track of how many decades it was. Uh, but that's a good thing, especially in a time of rapid innovation in the technological landscape, in that battle space. Um, having people who've got more time than to figure out where the, the PO box is or the APO box is, you know, to, to actually think about changing the mission and have that depth. I fully endorse that part of the report. I endorse 
the idea of two tracking. I thought there were great ideas in here. I'd go as far as to say this is the most important written document um, on reform I've seen come out this year. But caveat, my book came out in December last year. So, <laughs> so there, but um, I, I loved it. And uh, I look forward to discussion more about it. Great. Pa Paula, you've actually served as a flag officer in the Air Force before uh, going into RAND and doing analysis and, and had a lot of opportunity both on the education side, but also can look at this through the lens of being a flag officer. So tracking makes sense or not, and longer tours make sense or not? Okay, so um, I'll start with, um, I think that the report did something that, um, that I know personally I tried to do for when I was on active duty and when I was um, also in retirement, which was to try to draw attention to the importance of actually taking care of and growing general officers. Um, when somebody is magically promoted from colonel to one star, they don't instantly become smarter, wiser, and everything else. And, and I think that there is a huge gap um, that needs to be exploited. And I really commend you all for, um, uh, for, for identifying that. Now, having said that, um, uh, and there are certain parts of the report that um, I, I, I too am um, uh, very enthusiastic about, tracking is not one of them. Um, and, and the reason I'm, and I, and I say this in, in sort of an exploratory sense, the reason I'm not excited about the concept of tracking is, is that I think that what you create is you create a have, have not system um, uh, in the general officer corps, number one. Number two is, is that um, to this point of innovation, mm -hmm. um, if you are really looking to create an innovative leadership culture, the last thing that you do is track the folks that think alike. Mm -hmm. um, and by creating this, this this enterprise, which doesn't even sound military, um, by creating this enterprise track and this operational track, I think that even in the lexicon, you lose what is fundamental about the General Officer Corps, which is to provide at the most senior levels of the military to provide that guidance and that uh, to, to not only advise on how to, to uh, use the military uh, instrument of power as the civilian leadership encourages us to do, but also to be successful at it. Mm -hmm. um, when you take the enterprise and you separate it like that from the operational, the likelihood of those innovations, especially, uh, Tim, to your point, in this quick turn environment, um, I, I think actually you suboptimize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me take a crack at that, because uh, that was something we talked about during our research and it came up in a couple of different ways. And uh, one, of, one of the comments we got, particularly from younger officers, was that uh, I'm already specialized, I'm an acquisition person, but what I don't see is a pathway to four star or three star. I see that those are taken by operators at some point in time. So one, in, our, in our actual report itself, we have a chart, uh, a triangle chart that lays out on one half of the triangle examples of what the operational billets would be all the way up to four star, and on the other side, the, the enterprise. And at the top of the chart is the chairman and the vice chairman of the JCS. And the chairman we identify as an operator, vice chairman as an enterprise guy, because he's running, in a sense, the business of defense. Same thing with the services. The chiefs and the vices are of different flavors. And the reason for that is we're trying to find the opportunity for all of these people to have upward mobility. So what, what I've seen, and again, we heard from a number of folks out there in what we would call the enterprise track, is that young folks feel that even if they get selected for the enterprise track, if they get put in a non-combat specialty, they have a great opportunity up to about 06. And then their chances disappear, mm -hmm. and, and operators take over. And then we populate those upper ranks with operators. So we're suggesting some of that is probably going to continue to happen, but we have to be careful that we don't lose the expertise that those enterprise people get moving up, and that we find a way to reward the enterprise people the same way we've traditionally rewarded operators. And, and you know, there are there are legions of examples we found uh, during our research of an operator who, because he had to find a job, got plugged into clearly an enterprise spot that mm -hmm. they had no experience with whatsoever and had a vertical learning curve that typically ended after two years, they went on to something else. So we're, we think that's one way of avoiding that particular outcome. So, so just for the fun of it, um, one, of, one of the things that, that intrigues me is, is, is what about the possibility of bringing these, the, the enterprise folks, as you call them, more into the operational realm? Um, I, and I give you, for example, um, you mentioned that I was the, the commandant at the Air Force Institute of Technology. We had a lot of really bright, young engineers and scientists who wanted nothing more than to go down range, wanted nothing more that can, mm -hmm. than contribute to what was going on in Afghanistan and Iraq, they couldn't get there. 
Um, and so, so one of my, my questions is, is, it, is it, if, it, and, it's, and it literally is a question is, um, can we bring the operator into the enterprise and bring the enterprise into the operational realm? And, and, I, and I always go back to C.P. Snow and his, his um, a little treatise on science and government, which is we work best when we bring those two together. I think there's a lot of merit in that. You know, first, I, I think the idea of kind of having deputies and principals that are different from each other has a lot of value. Mm -hmm. We see that in, in OSD where we have civilian principals often in mill depths that are of, of very different flavors. I think there's lots of places to do that all the way up through the system in this regard. And I don't, I don't think necessarily what we're laying out would actually preclude that at all. I think it's got some great merit, but it's a super point, I think, to make yeah. as well. And I'd, I'd add, um, you know, this emphasis on flexibility. So one of the recommendations in the report was, or I guess one of the things that was highlighted, is how structured evaluations and promotion boards can be um, until you reach this point, the two-star, three-star point, and then the evaluations fall off. I think that's a really good point to add some more structure. But I also have a feeling that what's good for the goose is good for the gander that there is this informality, and that's not all bad. You don't want to throw all that out. Um, in, in the private sector, I think most people here know, uh, you don't have annual fit reps that take you from job to job. What you have are letters of recommendation. There's an informal network, and you apply for a new position. And there's also a lot of flexibility to not only take somebody who's a superstar at the age of 24 and make them the chief of marketing or the chief of engineering in your company, but to take someone who's 44 who really likes to hack. And in a world, in a battle space, where hacking's going to matter a lot more, I don't want to have to kick out a major who's the best hacker in the Navy. Or Army, I guess it would be. Uh, uh, <laughs> But that, that kind of flexibility is what commanders, as I come back to, when I've talked to senior officers, they, they get frustrated that they've got year groups and silos. So I like the idea of tracking, but I also think we should have flexibility to be able to cross those tracks. And flexibility, and I think this is an idea you endorse as well, but it's not in this report, but this idea of a continuum of service. So when we look at historical analogies, and today these matter a lot, historically when when uh, an officer has left the military and gone on to say greatness in the private sector, when the nation needs that person's service again, historically, they've been able to come back in. It's very difficult to do in the bureaucracy we have now. And you know, it wasn't that way even 40 years ago. But it definitely wasn't that way at the birth of the country. You know, George Washington left service for 17 years. He was an entrepreneur and a farmer and came back in after being a major to being the commander in chief of the army. So. You know, we've got a good track record of having a flexible military in the past. It'd be nice to bring that back. Well, one of the things we did was look at corporate practice. And maybe, Nora, you could talk a little bit about what we saw when we went to GE and their Croton Gulf study. Yeah, we, we did, a, as part of the research for the report, we wanted to look at private sector uh, analogs, you know, recognizing that the, the bottom lines for the military and the private sector are very different, right? Obviously, the private sector is about profit, whereas the military is about fighting and winning wars. Right. But particularly on some of this enterprise management area, if you're talking about human resources, information technology, all those things, there are a lot of, of parallels that do hold up with the military. Um, and we spent an absolutely fascinating afternoon at uh, General Electric's campus in Crotonville as part of our research on corporate best practices. And GE is, is well known for having a very, very well-developed executive education program. Um, two of the things that really jumped out at us while we were there that we thought um, you know, had, definitely had some particular applicability um, is that even in a time of financial constraint, responding to the 2008 market crash when GE's stock, like many other companies' stocks, fell in the, in the stock market mm -hmm. tumble, they had extensive plans underway to invest tremendous amounts of money in their executive education facility. And not only did they not cut it, they added to it at a time when corporate mm -hmm. profits were really teetering and the CEO <laughs> was under a lot of pressure because they saw that as so fundamental to what they were going to be doing for the future, that they wanted to make sure that they mm -hmm. nurtured that seed corn for what came later. And I think that's something, a, a parallel, that I think is extraordinarily important for the US military as it goes into a similar period of constrained resources. But I think the, the second one, and this goes to some of the, the points that you were making, is we were stunned. This isn't actually just GE, but we were told that the CEO of GE invests up to 40% of his time, 4-0, percent of his time with subordinate leaders, mm -hmm. mentoring them, having them over to his house over weekends to facilitate informal conversations, um, to have those conversations. It doesn't need to necessarily be in writing in a fitness report, mm -hmm. but to have those conversations about what the expectations were, um, not just so that the employee would be able to do better 
in their future career, but also so that the CEO and the very highest level people knew what talent there was in the organization mm -hmm. and enabled them as leaders <laughs> to develop succession plans to say, okay, this person will be ready for here, for this slot, you know, thinking a couple mm -hmm. of steps ahead. And also to say, we'd like this person shows potential for this area, but they need this additional development experience or additional skill to make it happen, and they can slot people in that way. And those were two things that you know really jumped out at us. Mm -hmm. You know, we were sort of discussing you know amongst ourselves after being there, saying you know how much time does you know a four-star general spend on mentoring subordinates? It's probably hard to qualify, but I would guess that the answer is quite variable depending on the person. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know that that is something that particularly as you're going to a smaller force and a smaller general officer court, thinking more strategically about who's going to fill what place, thinking about the developmental assignments they need to get there, we think is, is really important too. Yeah, maybe to pile on on that and, and to connect to some of the things Tim has written about, the, the degree to which, again, that we saw in GE that they were making immense efforts to learn everything about their senior most people, that they put effort, what we would characterize at the three-star level, to really interview by other senior executives to spend days with people to find out every bit of what made them tick to help <coughs> line them up for the best fit for the person in the job. And again, I contrast that in the military. My, my experience personally and then kind of watching this is that that got less and less and less beyond just personal knowledge at that point in time. And, and the amount of time mm. that various service chiefs, for example, invest in this varies widely from as little as 5% in some cases to few mm. would go more than about 20%, I think. So we were just taken aback to hear that uh, Jeff Ilmel and, uh, and his predecessors as well were spending huge amounts of their personal time to do this. So again, somewhat striking for the military. Paul, Paul, GE does some remarkable things in investing in education that, that in a lot of ways looks a lot like the military PME system. We were struck that it was structured, it was, it was stratified in terms of a progressive system over time, and that they continue to invest in people uh, as they went throughout their career. You spent lots of your military career on educational assignments looking at both flag officer education in particular uh, how would you rate us today, and where do you think we need to make some adjustments? Uh, flag officer education, um, geez, if I were using a graduate school level, I'd give us a B minus. Hmm. Um, uh, so, so uh, <laughs> ju just barely passing. Um, and 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 the and the and the the reason I I say that is is that we do have we do have something right. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but we have something that um, uh, the only thing that we have uh, corporately is capstone. Um, and capstone, from what I've observed and actually what I've seen um, uh, subsequent, I went in 2007 and what's happened since then, um, it's a series of briefings. Um, it's a series of, of uh, teaching colonels how to act like the briefer to, to pull apart a particular um, uh, slide, if you will. There's no reading. Hmm. Um, uh, there certainly isn't a seminar environment. So <laughs> if, you, if, you think about, um, if you think about a triad of, of what you might want to do to develop a general officer, um, you, want, you want that flag officer to, first of all, understand the privilege um, that they've been given. You want them to be able to deal with the pressure that's going to be on them and that will just accrue over time. Um, and then you want them to build the intellectual courage um, to ask those really, really tough questions um, and then be comfortable once they've gone through the analysis to be, to be comfortable with the intellectually um, difficult answer. Um, that might take them to a place that, that their organization, whether it's a service or a combatant command, um, doesn't want them to go. Flag officers, more than any other group in the military, are adult learners. They need to be actively challenged. They need to have first assumptions tested. They need to be taken back to their, their fundamental principles. How do you understand democracy? How do you understand civil military relations? And they need to have that thread pulled until they come to their own personal aha moment. Yeah, I would add just that uh, as we look back on the Capstone program, which was a spin out of Goldwater Nichols in 1986, the original program was in excess of 13 weeks, and it has been carved down to as little as three weeks wow. recently. It's going to be pushed back up to five weeks again in January of this year. But there was an intent in Congress's mind to have that be a significant investment in time for these flag officers. And again, because of the busyness, and to some extent, you know, this is, predates the wars of 9-11, because of the uh, frenetic activity and pace of flag officers, 
the military, the services have pushed back against that. And I think that's probably a, a loss. Well, and I think this is a place where, um, and, and one of the points that you and Nora make in the report um, about how to, how to think about um, two and three star education is very important because there is a continuum of, of, of education for um, these general officers. And, and it doesn't have to be a large chunk of time. It can be a continuum of getting together for a week or a few mm -hmm. days, as long as you have somebody mm -hmm. who is meeting them intellectually and really challenging them. Mm -hmm. now, I, and, I, and I wanted to mention, I don't want the evening to slip away without complimenting some of the other big ideas. I thought the HCSC concept is a, is a great one. Um, Higher command and staff course, which we yeah, were saying sorry. about a three-month course for uh, two-star selects that are operators. But, uh, uh, I want to push back a little bit. I guess you can take the professor out of the classroom, but you can't mm -hmm. take the classroom out of the professor. I looked at the curriculum and the syllabus you'd all laid out, and it all looked interesting, but it didn't have what I, what I think you, or I hope you'll endorse, it didn't have a bullet point or a course recommendation for managing people. And, and that, I think, is you know, understanding the strategy of warfare and the changing battle space. But you know, if this idea has legs and we've got some congressional staffers and and uh, folks at the Pentagon who say, okay, let's implement this. Let's make sure that a couple weeks are dedicated to thinking about not just leading people. I mean, we, we ooze leadership in the military, but managing people and bring in the folks from GE and the folks from PNG. And PNG has a, a very similar pyramid-like hermetically sealed workforce. They don't bring in a lot of outsiders once you're on the promote, but they do a very good job of ev evaluating internally all the way up, as you all do point out. I would want to make those lessons front and center and, and maybe have this report be part of the curriculum. <laughs> Great. Well, well, one point that the report kind of alludes to, and, and we actually found this as a takeaway as, as we went through the, uh, the end points of our research, is that the, the fact that there are no evaluations and there's no written, typically, performance setting for three, three and four star officers, we thought was a striking divergence from what best corporate practice was. We also, we alluded earlier tonight to the uh, issues that uh, Tom Ricks and others have written about, about accountability for senior flag and general officers, and that's been much in the newspapers. We don't want to belabor the point, but we also think that the fact that a very rigorous structured system that's built on expectation setting, what the Army would call OER support forms or fitness support forms, uh, sitting down and counseling people about what the expectations of the jobs are before they begin the job, and then at a minimum circling back a year later with a written performance evaluation that documents for the rest of your career how you did in that job for that year is pretty important. And it's important enough in the military that that's what feeds the promotion boards that are statutorily driven by U.S. code that meet to select officers for promotion from 03 all the way to 08. And as, as Nora noted earlier, that system stops cold at the rank of Major General or <coughs> Rear Admiral upper half in the Navy. We thought that was actually a shortcoming. I mean, the system becomes much less visible, much more opaque, much more driven by the service chiefs and the four stars at that point, which may not be bad, but it loses some of the benefits of the rigor and the transparency that every officer understands that they're going to have a written sit down with their boss, mm -hmm. laying out specifically what they're looking to do in the job, have some follow on conversations, and ultimately have a written report that's gonna go on their record for the rest of their career that says how well they did. If we don't hold three and four stars accountable to that system that everyone is comfortable with, uh, it certainly raises the questions about whether accountability can really be reinforced at that level, and if we're actually building on the great success we had in the rest of the system, going all the way up to two-star general. So we thought that was a pretty interesting insight. Maybe a final comment, uh, final question here before we uh, turn it over to you for uh, aud audience uh, questions as well. And it, this circles us back around to the uh, next generation of chairmen and service chiefs and the generation after that already being in the force out there. Um, we've got a hermetically closed system, as Tim pointed out. Uh, we don't bring people in from uh, Microsoft to be our information technology managers. We don't bring people in uh, who run hotel management to do installation management across the services. We, we grow our own from 01, second lieutenant, and ensign all the way up to the top of the, the pyramid there. Those folks are already in the force. They're gonna be dealing with the education, development, selection system that we have. They're, they are the millennial generation, mm -hmm. Tim, uh, mm -hmm. which you've written a lot about. And, and I've got two sons that are, uh, one a former Army captain as of a few weeks ago and, and one who's still serving on active duty, who, who are very much of that generation who see the world through a different set of eyes than I do and a lot of the people leading the military today. 
So I want to maybe hear from both uh, Tim on that score and millennials, maybe Paul on the idea whether we ought to be thinking about some more creative ways to bring in talent from outside the military, and then we'll turn it over to your questions after that. Yeah, I think uh, I was asked a question the other day about uh, does the Army have too many generals? You know, does the Navy have too many admirals? And in a time of sequestration, I guess the default answer is yes, whether I agree with it or not. Um, but I, 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 I've always been puzzled by this notion of the tooth to tail ratio. Being an intelligence guy, worked in human intelligence, I was pretty definitively in a you know interesting career field, but it was very much on the tail side of the equation. And so you know, tooth is great, but especially in the Air Force, we're going through a big culture shift with a move towards drones, uh, UAVs. The Navy, another CNAS report out recently is about UUVs. Fascinating how that landscape is changing. And that means there's going to be more tail, at least in manpower, and, and less tooth. That's not necessarily bad. The point is, it's very hard to predict what the future force needs to look like. And when you're planning out 30 years and saying, well, this is what we want someone to look like at 30 years, that's a technology now with cyber that didn't exist 30 years ago. So we, we couldn't have planned for it back in 1983, but here we are. And there are combat veterans from you know, with tours in, in Iraq and Afghanistan working at Google, working at Microsoft with cyber capabilities. And the fact that you know, they've walked through that one-way door, I think, is a mistake. And, and we'll need and we'll want them back and we'll want talent now that we can't imagine. Paul, is it time to relook that hermetically sealed system? Uh, I, I think so. Um, I think, um, but to Tim's point, uh, once we know a little bit more about what it is we're looking for, mm -hmm. two names come to mind, um, actually, when you were speaking. Um, uh, we, we've had lateral entry historically. Um, mm -hmm. Knudsen, during the Second World War, went from being the president of GM to a three-star. Um, and he didn't do anything other than um, uh, talk to President Roosevelt on the way. Um, Jimmy Doolittle did a stop-out program, right? Mm -hmm. He got out in 1935 and then came in, uh, now he came back as a lieutenant colonel mm -hmm. um, in 1940. But there was a flexibility in, in terms of, of how we think about and manage talent. Um, but it was for, these were for specific uh, purposes in a very extreme period in our, in our history. Um, but I think any system that is hermetically sealed like that um, misses opportunities. And so I think that part of, and I think this was a real contribution of your report, it, you know, to get folks thinking about what are other ways that we can grow general officers that strengthen the force rather than diluting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only point I would add to that is we also ought to keep in mind and probably do a better job of thinking about the reserve component when we have that discussion. Absolutely. You know, a, lot of, a lot of what's in their support it tends to be viewed through the lens of active component. The reserve component have those, should have those cyber battalions outside Silicon Valley, should have those media battalions outside of Hollywood, should, right. should be able to leverage those skills in the private sector to be able to have the military take advantage of the very top talent out there, which again, not always the case today. All right, well, it's time for your questions. I'm going to turn the mic over to Nora to uh, moderate this second half here. We've got about 30 minutes, and hopefully we'll have a good set of tough questions from folks out of the audience. Nora? So I'd like to ask you if uh, when you stand to give your question, please make sure to say your name, um, your affiliation. Um, please ask a question, no statements, please. And uh, please keep it brief, because we have a pretty full house. And there's mics floating around the room that we can get to you here. David Steigman, retired U.S. Naval officer. You mentioned that some of the more flagrant cases of GOFO misbehavior. In a couple of the cases that I've read about in the papers that involved gambling or padding expense accounts with family members, isn't this a case that no matter how much they're having a four star look at a three star or a two star. If they don't get by the time get it by the time they're even a one star, that you hold a position of trust. You're not to go gambling with command funds, no matter how much you have someone looking over you. And I've been in government and the private sector and I've seen the same thing that mm. as long as pe some people think they can get away with it. You th so the question is, is having that four-star look at a three-star going to do anything if the person, by the time they've become a two-star and three-star? Well, now, you all had, I think, mentioned also the, the benefits of peer review 
right, in, in this report. And maybe that's something where I think if you get peers as part of the evaluation process, it, it, it really cleans up some of that behavior. Yeah, yeah but, to, but to, to that point, I mean, let's take the, the general or flag officer out of it. Let's, you know, talk a JO or, or a first term airman. Um, uh, if they don't get it, they need to be gone. Mm -hmm. um, and now these are allegations, um, and, and I'm not prejudging the outcome, but there are certain things that, that we're held accountable for under the Uniform Code of Military Justice right. that are just unacceptable. Um, and and so, so, um, uh, so from that perspective, if those allegations prove correct, um, then, then this becomes ancillary to, to a much larger issue. Excellent panel. Uh, George Nicholson, a policy consultant. Dave, you talked about a balance between having an operator in a senior position and his deputy being a non-operator. The current chief of staff of the Air Force, Mark Welch, is an operator, but his vice chief of staff is a pure non-operator. Did you all look at that or, or talk to uh, General Welch or General Spencer about how that decision was made? We, we did not, but it's a great point, and, and I, that, that's almost the exact exemplar of what we're suggesting. That, that is so mm -hmm. unusual to see that happen. He's a financial management uh, four-star vice chief of staff of the Air Force. Who in a time of budget constraints is going to know the challenges of running the Air Force, making tough decisions, lining up the acquisition balance better than somebody who's come up through that side of the enterprise part of the Air Force as we would characterize it. So that's almost exactly what we're looking for. now. You know, there, there's ways that that could go back and forth. You could see a service chief of one flavor and a vice of an operator flavor. Uh, in some ways, the Marines do that between aviation and ground, although they would, they would argue that those are both operators, but they're very different kinds of parts of the Marine Corps. And they keep that balance, you know, in tune, you know, throughout, you know, decades of, of service on the, uh, in the senior Marine rank. So I think that's exactly what we're talking about. And, and the, the, the reason we said, we actually put on our chart, who the four-star mm -hmm. enterprise and who the four-star operators were because it shows that there is a path for everybody. It's not, it's not advantage operator or advantage enterprise. Both sides have equal opportunities to move up and be successful in their own fields of expertise. And the Air Force right now today, very unusually, I think is a great example of that. Hi, uh, Scott Cheney Peters. I'm on the uh, Navy staff. Uh, you talked about the extended length of military careers and excellent 44 year old hackers. Uh, yet today's military is uh, generally kind of an up or out sort of an organization. Yeah. Um, did you give any consideration uh, in either the broader military context or at the flag officer level uh, to an option or opportunities for opting to stay in their current capacity? and develop and deepen those skill sets as opposed to promoting up or leaving service? Well, I, I thought, um, I, maybe I'm repeating myself, and I, I really like the suggestion of longer tenure, and that's a dangerous word, tenure, because sometimes it means you, you have the right and you can never be <laughs> moved out. I think just a longer term for jobs, and that's, as I read it, at, at all ranks you're making that recommendation, which I think is a great idea. Um, I, in my conversations with, um, uh, senior officers, I, I've heard the phrase used, well, that won't work because everybody needs to get their turn, right? Whether it's a brigade command or battalion command, and if we don't rotate them out as quickly, then, you know, can you imagine that logic being applied to Eisenhower? Like, well, you've done a pretty good job in 1943, but somebody else needs their turn for 44 and 45. So there's a benefit to having folks in command, not necessarily for the career of all the folks serving, and you know, Eisenhower spent a very long time as a junior officer, um, but for the benefit of the mission and the nation and innovation. So I liked that, and I, I want to endorse that part of this report where not only the term at the high level, but the, the term recommendation being longer and having, the, again, flexibility to do that at the junior level is a great idea. I don't know if that answers your question fully either. Well, I'd only add that in some of our previous works, we talked about flexible career paths, uh, being able to have a continuum of service, being able to move out of the military, come back in the military, so I think that's all part in, in a lot of this, uh, Tim you know, echoes very strongly in his, his book on Bleeding Town, that's part of a reformed military personnel system, in which, which we're saying we need to build a flag rank 
reform on top of that reform basic system as well. Now the question asked though, uh, up or out, and, and, and I think anybody here that's followed this knows that that's the law, but what's really happened in the implementation, the law since 1980, um, it's really become an, an, an out or up, right? So if you didn't get out, you, you sort of automatically get promoted. And the Army knows it's going to have to change that. It's going to basically have to go from fourth gear to first gear. It has to re-implement and disappoint some people that thought, you know, gee, aren't I going to get this automatic promotion? I, I can't comment on all the particulars, but I think that has to change, and Congress has to play a role in reforming up or out because it's not how we've operated historically. And I think this experiment since 1980 is it's one of the hindrances um, in keeping the best people at the junior level. That maybe they're not going to be general or admiral, flag rank officer, but we still want them in uniform and they want to stay. That's okay. Oh, a lot of hands. Uh, yeah, right here. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Oh, there's a mic coming. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Leanne Howard from U.S. Special Operations Command, J-5. Uh, I have a two-part question. The first one is, is there any desire to expand this research to building better Department of Defense professionals? <laughs> <laughs> and question two really goes to uh, understanding the future security environment and the fact that we're looking at a lot more uncertainty in the next 20 years as we work through upcoming strategic documents and the fact that with this uncertainty, power bases and the, the skill sets from across those power bases will blend as we go forth in the world. So in looking at this, we have a drop in the bucket in terms of our placements across the interagency and on Capitol Hill. Has your research led you to believe that we should perhaps expand this and at what levels? Thank you. I'll take the first crack at that. So every report has to scope itself somehow. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we stayed with generals because that we bit off a large <laughs> amount that we addressed in this report. Some of our other work at CNAS has talked about the interagency set of issues and the whole of government approaches. And I think that those are, are very important. What I would say the piece of this report that touches on the point that you bring up is we see that as part of the critical education that needs to happen for those who are selected to flag rank. Um, and that's the part of why we focus this idea of the higher command and staff course, you know, whatever the US equivalent would be, focusing a lot on political military understanding. Um, you know, as I said at, at the beginning of my remarks, we were just struck at how there's no educational experience in the second half of the officer's careers, if you know, assuming you go to 40 years. And it, in the same way, I mean, this is this is a gross simplification, but you know, there are currently two extended educational periods in any officer's career, right? The first happens when they go to the intermediate level professional military education. And again, as a rough generalization, that is designed to help the officers in those programs bridge the tactical and operational levels of war. So you're going from having been really, you know, down in the dirt or, you know, working uh, in the boiler room of a ship or something like that, mm -hmm. um, to understanding the operational context and how the bigger pieces fit together. We, there's then also, for those officers who stay in, there's an educational opportunity at the senior professional military education, and that really helps bridge the uh, operational and now strategic levels of war to get an even bigger perspective and to understand how things fit together. One of the things that we saw really missing and why we recommended this adding a, a new course at this particular time when people are promoted to the two-star rank is because something else needs to be there to help officers make the jump from now the strategic level of war as a purely military thing to grand strategy, implementing all elements of national power, looking at what role that mm -hmm. Paula alluded mm -hmm. to this, what role the military plays in society, looking at other elements of national power and how the military fits into that. And so, you know, those kinds of assignments, and we talk a lot in this report about broadening experiences, I think exactly goes to the point that you're making. Mm. Yeah, I maybe would add one point. I interviewed a former dean at the Army War College who had had a long conversation uh, with General Shali Kashvili, the former chairman of JCS, many years after he had retired. And, and Shali Kashvili told him, you go back and tell those War College students that they're going to have to reach back into that well of their War College time for 18 or 20 years after they've graduated because that's the last, that's the last time I had to think as the chairman. I, I was reaching back that many years. Hmm. And in, in a world that's moving as fast as the one we're in right now, that's probably not a really good thing. The world of 18 years ago looks nothing like the world we're in today. And so the idea that we want to implant some more of that education proximate to the really tough decisions flag officers have to make 
makes a whole lot of sense as opposed to having to reach way back into their the depths of their mind dealing with a different world that they were in when they were a student at the War College. Tom Keeney from Johns Hopkins Sice. I have, uh, I'm surpri a little surprised that you put so much emphasis on the three and four star written appraisals. Um, I would think that by the time this, we're talking about a small enough group that the, uh, the knowledge of these through informal and uh, communication and also with, uh, with civilians so much involved, it wouldn't be necessary. In other words, written appraisals for lawyers because you have so many people to deal with, that's all you have. Mm. But I think a three and four star journals, you know these folks. Mm. Uh, and beyond that, uh, you don't mention anything about the appraisal system beyond below that. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, did you look at the appraisal system of one and two star journals? Or are you ge generally satisfied that you're getting the kind of information without a great deal of grade inflation? And mm -hmm. uh, tacked mm -hmm. onto that, if you have this high level education, are they going to be graded on this? Mm. In other words, are they going to be looking who, see, who does well and who does not do well? That at the 06 level is not done at all, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah, let me take a few shots at that. Um, we w generally are satisfied with the one and two, two star level evaluation process because it mirrors what they've come up with. You know, there are the same rules in place, there are the same sit downs, there are promotion boards that review those. So that, that's a fairly structured statutorily driven system. The reason that we felt it was important at three and four star is not that this group didn't know each other, and there's roughly about 48 four star officers in the US military, and about 150 or so pushing upward to 175 uh, three star officers. So it's not a tiny group, uh, but, it's, but it's a group that's gonna know each other within their service, certainly. Sure. But yeah, within the service, they'll, they'll certainly know, know each other. The reason that we thought it was important to document their performance in writing is because it reminded them that their performance was going to be documented in writing. Instead of getting in a culture where there was no longer anything that I did, it was going to be written down, it was going to be recorded, going to be looked at by the Senate, by a promotion board, by my boss, That's, that tends to put people in a bit of a different mental picture. So we thought there's actually a lot of utility to continuing that process they're used to. Not because there needs to be a promotion board, people that don't know them are going to evaluate them, but just to send the message that you are still accountable, it is going to be in writing, and it's something you're going to sit down and look at with your boss every year to see how you did and before the year starts what you ought to be doing. So we thought that, that was kind of important. You want to talk about HCSC a bit? Yeah, one of the interesting things about the British model, we didn't go so far as to recommend this for a, you know, a US version of a higher command and staff course. The students in that course are explicitly ranked in their course, and that directly affects their future assignments. Mm -hmm. So we want to have the same kind of assessment matter for future assignments. We weren't ready to go as far as saying rank them one through 10 or anything like that. But that, yes, that is absolutely critical. You know, we think that that should be happening, frankly, at, at all levels of PME. Mm -hmm. But we would build that, that principle into uh, the course that we recommend what, very what's much. What's fascinating about that is, is that that would require a profound culture change. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I happen to fully agree with you that, that you need to be judged in your academic performance every bit as much as you're ch judged in your field performance. Yeah. Um, but that is culturally completely divorced from where reality is right now. Um, and to, to inject it at the, the, the general officer ranks without injecting it at earlier um, yeah. levels of education um, would be even a more profound <laughs> culture we, change. We are starting to see that at the, at the Army War College. I know we have a number of folks from there here tonight because I hear the students complaining about how hard they're being worked, how many papers they have to write, and the fact they're being graded on each and every one of those, and they have oral comps, all kinds of things that you don't find in a lot of military programs. So, so I, uh, I, I can't help telling a little story. I remember being at the Air Force Academy, and the summer that I showed up, we had to do, we learned this technique called the sandwich approach when you were giving feedback to a subordinate, which is you say something nice, then you give them what you really want to say, and then you say something nice. So we would have you know, senior cadets come up and say, nice shoes, you're a horrible person, please leave, nice haircut. And so um, with that, let me give the sandwich approach to the Army's uh, evaluation system. They, they just implemented a reform that included peer evaluation in part of their what you'd call fit rep. But I think it's terrible. Um, it's not terrible. We'll see how it's implemented. It gives too much flexibility and it can, it can develop very poorly. And here's how it works as I understand it. That you're allowed to, you're required once every three years to initiate, and I'm not sure if the way this is written that you actually have to complete it, uh, peer evaluation uh, and subordinate evaluation but you get to pick who those two peers and two subordinates will be. Now, that's not the kind of feedback that I hope we can get to our, to our mid-career Army officers. 
We do peer evaluation in ranger school. It works, right? It, 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 from every ranger I've talked to, they think that was one of the highlights. And we have distinguished graduates at a lot of our other schools that we already do. So there will be a culture shock, but it's one we can draw on that we're using in, in, other, in other programs. So that's my sandwich. <laughs> yes. Mike. Cynthia Wright, uh, Air Force uh, CIO and Cyber Operations. Um, and I have a question that ties to the last one and to the previous comment about uh, promoting people who all think alike. I wonder if you looked at the influence of service culture, the differences between service culture and the effectiveness of general officers. It seems to me that there's a significant difference between services in, the, in how general officers tend to value consensus and collegiality in their, um, in their decision making. And I wonder if that is something that you all addressed as, um, as being a factor in how effective they are as general officers. It gets to the peer review system and also to promoting people who, who think alike at, during a time of innovation. Is this something that stifles innovation or is it something that allows us to come to a decision and, and move forward in some corporate way? Well, let me, let me uh, take a shot at that. I think we, we did not look at the uh, cultural differences in the flag officers between the four different uh, services per se. We were keenly aware of the differences between the services in their education and how they value education, how they send people to resident education or not. And those are rather different. The numbers are different. Uh, the value each service uh, puts on that is considerably different. And we, we're very much aware of that. I think there's probably some places where that ought to come together. On the consensus side, though, I actually, uh, we, probably the, the most interesting quote that I have, think we have in the report is uh, Mike Mullen's quote about ducks picking ducks mm -hmm. uh, at the uh, senior most flag officer ranks. And he was talking, I think, about primarily about four stars, which is a pretty bold statement to make. He made that when he was chairman. And, and that's part of the question is that you want to, back to Paula's point about how, how do you make sure you don't have single-minded thinking in either the ops career field or the enterprise career field, never between the two shall mix. Great, great question, great reason to have different kinds of deputies and principals. But we really didn't drill into the service aspects of that. I, I think the other thing that, uh, that's helpful in that regard are joint assignments, is that you get people, and that, that you know, as a result of the uh, 86 Goldwater Nichols legislation, you now, to be a flag officer, you have to be you know, joint qualified as an 05, 04, 05, 06. You have to serve another tour typically as a flag officer to continue to advance. That has, has chiseled off some of those sharp edges that are unique to service cultures. But then you go back to your service, and you have to deal with the realities of you having been in a joint assignment, number one, and then the fact your service may not look at that quite the same way. So I, I think that's going to be kind of a continued work in progress. And each service is going to look at this report, I think, quite a bit differently based upon those service cultures. More hands going up as we go along. Yeah. Yes, in the back, way in the back. Good evening. Oh boy. Okay. I'm Kimberly Jackson from the Office of Secretary of Defense, Special Operations, Low Intensity Conflict. I'm interested in what your take is on the pipeline issue. So I know a lot of attention has been focused on um, how to promote uh, basically 07s through 010. Um, what I'm really interested in is what attention you paid to keeping in the right 03s, the right 04s, and I understand you had to absolutely scope your report, but if you had the we opportunity... scoped our report. <laughs> <laughs> but if you had the opportunity to have looked at that issue, how do you think that your findings may have been different? We'll kick that to you because you've actually written well, directly on this. So, so I've recommended the flexibility and sort of analyzed why we end up with a siloed system and with a uh, year group system and you know, collected, again, feedback, I think was one of the most popular options among the active duty troops was to get rid of year groups, um, which not only lets people get promoted faster, and that's how it gets mischaracterized in the media. This isn't about the, you know, the, the super entrepreneurial folks that want to be promoted quickly. It's about letting people track, in a sense, where they want to track. The reason that the military uses year groups is it's a, it's a management problem. You know, how can you deal with, it's, it's already tough enough to deal with, I don't know, 50 captains or 50 majors in this particular branch. Um, how could you deal with hundreds at a time, thousands at a time? The Army alone is a workforce of over a million people when you count the Guard and Reserves. Uh, but if you build flexibility in the system and you let commanders do hiring, rather than having it centrally managed, then you can, 
you can sort out efficiently and you can sort of figure out where people want to be. You get a little bit more honesty in the system too about somebody that doesn't want to pretend that they want to be you know, a four-star general. And they just want to really go to work in this one slot, whether it's in cyber or low intensity conflict. Um, I think that's one solution, but it's probably the toughest nut to crack. And it's one that we need to write more reports on. <laughs> Dave, Dave, you've also written on this as well. Well, well one, one comment I would just add, uh, I, an interesting conversation about just about two weeks ago with a uh, recently retired four star from another service. And, and his comment was, we lose our best four star generals at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. And that was rather striking to hear from this guy I've known for you know three decades. And the, the, the issue there is we're now about to go into a drawdown. There's great risk. Tim's written about this. I've written a bit about it. With great risk that the best people or many of the best people will choose the exit because they know the military is getting smaller, budget's going to be tight, they're not going to be in combat anymore, which perversely sounds attractive if you're a civilian, but is not attractive if you're actually going to be in the military. And they may decide to move out. So the military is going to have to work very, very hard in this next five to eight years to keep in the very best people under these conditions so that we don't end up with a military filled with kind of the middle, middle ranks of talent uh, as we come out of this drawdown. And we know the one thing, I think, from the different services went through drawdowns, uh, and, and early in my career I saw this, where uh, they had bonuses for people to leave. You know, so you see bonuses for people to stay in that everybody gets, even if 90% of them were going to stay in, very expensive. But bonuses for uniformed officers to get out is sort of a, a magnet for the risk averse to stay in. And so, you know, there are smart ways to do this. There are no easy ways to do it, but let's not do the dumb ways at least. <laughs> yeah, here up front. Stephen Mellis with Professional Analysis. Uh, just to get back to the tenure question, you mentioned that the armed forces are going to be operating under budget constraints and in uh, streamlined capacities. To what extent do you think that longer terms in these uh, flag officers' billets will help to promote uh, more streamlining, more efficiency, uh, help to modernize the force and get away from relying on old practices and old equipment uh, as we go forward? I'll take the first crack at that. One of the concepts that we highlighted in the report and, and why we argue for extended tenure times in assignment is because it enables what's called double loop learning, mm -hmm. right? So you get to make a decision, see it through, see its consequences through, see what works and what doesn't, and then make similar types of decisions using the knowledge that you've gained. Right, right now, especially if you're only in for 15 months in a position, or, or even if you're in for two years, it's very hard to see that happen. You just don't have the time to understand your job, get in there, figure out what your assignment and, and mission is, make those decisions, see them all the way through, and then get another opportunity to shape them. Um, and that's something that we think is critically important for whatever the mission is. I think that that's going to be particularly important for reform efforts, because right now, especially if you're you know, only going to be there 18 months or two years, you don't have a whole lot of incentives to rock the boat. And frankly, a lot of uh, you know, staff members who are going to keep being there will you know, wait you out and try to kill off reforms. Um, but it has, it has huge implications, not just for the process of reform and adapting to you know, the current uh, environment that DOD is going to have to be in, but for all aspects of a, a, that officer's mission. In the back, on the end, on the aisle. Otto Kreischer, reporter for Sea Power Magazine, retired 05. A little conflict possibly between your wanting longer tours and you wanting upward mobility, make sure everybody has a, has a, has a chance to rise to the top. Various times in, our, in my time, we had the conflict, you know, that we, we wanted to keep people in, keep our best, but then we ended up with guys being stagnated, stagnated at, uh, at lower levels and they couldn't move up because people were in their place. So that's when we went to, you know, up, up or out. Uh, isn't there the problem that if you, you get everybody at three and four star and they get there to stay four or five years, you know, there's no place for, uh, for the, your, your two and three stars to, to move up? Yeah, let me, let me take that. that. That's a great question, and it's going to be a fun. If you're a personnel person in the room and you're working flag assignments, this is going to be one of your critical questions on this report, which is how do you make the math work here? I've got to have three years in grade before I can retire in that grade. If I move to two jobs, I've got to you know, stay in the second one long enough to stay. So there, there's all kinds of 
nuance and flag officer assignments that'll force uh, some unnatural uh, acts when you go to a three to five year tour. We're, we're saying that's still the right thing to do. And we, we also note that the first year of these jobs ought to be probationary. And there ought to be opportunities to move people laterally without penalty if they're not a good fit. What we, what we found out in a couple of the corporate places we looked, and GE stood out in this in particular, hmm. is that they, they worked immensely hard up front to find the exact right round peg for the exact right round hole. That's not necessarily the characteristic most people in the military associate with flag officer management. Uh, it, it's more of an interchangeable parts model. I think most folks that have lived through that. But we're saying that you've got to spend a lot more time up front, you the military, to find exactly the right person to get in there. To find the Keith Alexander, who's going to be just the right fit for five years at NSA. To find the Stan McChrystal, who's going to be just the right fit for five years as the JSOC commander and get those benefits not to put the wrong person in there. And that, that is more often than not the case today. So I think you sacrifice, not everybody's gonna to get to be a four star, there's not gonna be as many people getting to be four stars, but if you pick the right people to be four stars and you, you put a lot of investment up front in getting that right, the benefits are, are immense compared to some of the things we may have seen over the last couple of decades. We are almost out of time. I'm gonna to have to cut off questions, unfortunately, because I wanna give both Tim and Paula a chance for any last comments or thoughts you wanna share. Um. I'll, I think we'll be around. I'll, I'll stick around to talk to anyone who has questions I didn't get to answer. And um, yeah, I've, I've thought a little bit about the, the problem. And I, there's, again, not an easy solution when uh, you have a system that gives longer tenure. I still think it's a good idea. I come back to thinking how long Eisenhower was stuck at a lower rank, but it, it turned out okay. People still knew who, who Eisenhower was and, and he got out from under MacArthur's uh, shadow and was able to prosper. And it was a surprise at the time, but it required a lot of investment by Marshall to know who his officers were. Um, I think a lot about uh, some Civil War generals um, who were tracked for a long time at lower ranks as engineers. And I remember someone told me that if you're an engineer in the Army, the highest you can get is three stars. Just there's no possible way. And the, the, the way it's been designed now, you just can't get in that career field and go up. So there's already some inflexibility, and I think if we move to a more flexible system, it doesn't mean everything's perfect. It doesn't mean everybody's gonna get their turn. It probably means the opposite, but I think it will be better for the military, and I really applaud you guys thinking through some of the tough questions here. Paula? Um, th this conversation actually brought out a, a, a remote memory about how Omar Bradley um, was developed. And it goes to the, the counterfactual about how do we know we're keeping the right people in and we assume that we aren't. Omar Bradley, if you look at his early career, he spent nine years teaching at West Point. Huh. Um, and one of the things that we might do, the, the, the JOs that I've talked to, and this has been constant since I've been affiliated with the military, is the good ones are intellectually hungry. So take care of that hunger, feed it, send mm. them to really good graduate schools, um, put them in peer teaching environments, put them at, at, at the service academies. SOCH does this great at, at, at West Point. Yep. But what, that, shouldn't be, it, that shouldn't be an exception. It, it should be, we should be able to leverage all of these educational institutions where not only do you feed the intellectual hunger, um, or, or take care of it. Um, but also what you do is you build the intellectual capital. Um, and you're not building it episodically, you are building it um, holistically. And I think that that's something, um, Bradley first went to West Point at, at the five year point, teaching math, he was like one week ahead of his students. Um, and then he did a return, a return tour there. Um, these are great places to develop in interwar years and we're entering them. Um, this is a great place to develop some of, uh, some of our very fine officers. Mm -hmm. I'd like to end by going back to a point that, Paula, you made at the beginning, which is uh, drawing attention to this issue. We've had a very nuanced conversation, and we're deeply grateful to both of you for being here and, and sharing your insights. But one of the things that we really sought to do with this report was to draw attention to these set of issues and get a debate going. Um, and we were just so gratified to see a packed room on what you know, could be interpreted as a fairly arcane subject uh, that we think of as incredibly strategically important. And obviously, by the turnout and your thoughtful questions and your interest in this topic, clearly is not just arcane, because it's very profound and has tremendous implications. So thank you again, Tim and Paul, and thank all of you for coming this evening. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks. 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 Thanks.